What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today I'm eager to get into some conversation with Raj about what well, contributing to Bitcoin projects in general and what the latest uh, things are uh, in the market, uh, including Taproot and many other exciting new aspects to this amazing technology. So Raj, welcome today. How are you? Hey, Max, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm doing really great. How are you? And it's, uh, it's really great to have uh, be in your show. And uh, yeah, let's see what we can talk about. And uh, yeah, it will be have a we'll, we're gonna just have a fun Bitcoin conversation. Yes. So I'm curious. Uh, before you even discovered the Bitcoin rabbit hole, like where were you at? What was your kind of drive in life? What were you working on? Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, actually the my path of Bitcoin I think started way before I actually found out about Bitcoin. Uh, so when I was back in my college and doing my master's, uh, I have my background in civil engineering. I'm a structural engineer and uh, I got graduated in 2014. And after that, I did my post grad uh, and I completed that in 2016. So when I was doing my post grad, I always wanted to be in academia. I always wanted to be like studying stuff, doing maths, solving problems, this kind of thing. I, always, I, I never really liked the corporate culture and doing job and that part. But when I actually ended up in academia, uh, a lot of the things about academic structures, the shenanigans that goes over there, the usual stuff and and also I was like falling out of love with my subject. So back in 2015, uh, I was like sitting in my dorm room and I had this PhD offer. I had good grades, so they offered me direct PhD option. So I just had to go and ask my guide and, and just tell my guide yes. And they, he would have consumed me in the same project that I have been working for my master's thesis into a PhD program. And I was deciding whether what should I do? Like uh, I always wanted to do a PhD, but I don't like the subject. I don't like the structure. So that point I decided like maybe uh, if PhD is all about learning and self-studying because that's what a PhD scholar does anyway. Uh, so why not I choose my own subject instead of asking the institutions to give me or assign me a subject to work on. And uh, that sounds like a crazy enough idea to me that I thought like, okay, let's do that. So long story short, I decided to drop the PhD and I joined a corporate setup. I was working in the Western coast of India, Mumbai in an oil and gas company from 2016 to almost like end of 2017. I was basically start uh, studying theoretical physics just for fun. I was like looking into all the lecture series and all the textbooks that I can find. I will come back from my office and study hard equations like other people watched Netflix. I just did maths. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so this went on for like one to two, two and a half years. And until I reached to a position like I have almost covered most of the basics that I can gather from open internet. Now the next obvious thing that makes sense for me is to join a um, bachelor program on physics and start my physics career from there. So then I was again thinking like, okay, I have spent this much of time being a civil engineer. So does it make sense to start all over again, do physics and all stuff? And uh, at, th at those points, like I wasn't really sure what to do about life. I was like, I had a stable job. I, I didn't much worried about my career and stuff. And so at that moment, it was like end of 2017, October, I found out about Bitcoin. And uh, the moment I found out about Bitcoin, I kind of realized like this is exactly the kind of thing that I have been waiting for a kind of subject which is intriguing enough, which can spark my curiosity and which I can just like delve into after like coming back from office and forgetting the world. So that's how I started my Bitcoin journey. Back at the very beginning, it was just for curiosity. I just wanted to understand what this thing is, what the heck is happening, what people are talking about. And and very soon I found out like it's a very, very deep rabbit hole and there are like ton of, it's not just one rabbit hole, it's just like multiple rabbit hole connected at different level of the bottoms. And um, 
there are a ton of ways of explorations and i started my journey not really knowing like what exactly i want to be or what exactly i want to do it's just something um, i start i i fell in love with learning i fell in love with uh, discovering i then uh, as soon as that process started i figured out like okay there are a lot of grounds that you need to cover in order to understand bitcoin at the technical level you need to have some kind of understanding of cryptography you need to have some kind of understanding of economics you need to have some kind of understanding of computer science programming and all these different disciplines coming and merging together and becoming into this subject that we call as bitcoin and uh, so i um, at that time it uh, that idea took hit me and that what i was thinking in my dorm room that what if like i decide my own phd like what if i don't ask the institution to assign me a phd program instead i assign myself the study material i assign myself the project i assign myself the goal and if i just keep on doing that what happens so that was my initial question and what ended up happening is like i i i i found out different parts of the discipline where i could see my interest and my um, expertise get aligned on and i could work on those stuff and over time those get builded up uh, in a such a way that i started i i started to write code and read code and understand code uh um, and uh, this went on for one one and a half years until i found out like i am actually in that position where i can like drop my civil engineering career and start looking for a bitcoin career full time and uh, i was exploring different open source projects where i can contribute into in last one year starting from the pandemic lockdown situation and uh, ironically this lockdown situation also helped me a lot because uh, suddenly i found out like uh, there are a lot of extra free time the commute time get reduced because i was working from home and i could like work parallelly on bitcoin stuffs also on my civil engineering stuffs by two monitors putting in the same place that i couldn't do in office so this this last year since start of 2020 has been a really big productivity boost for me uh i have the last year around me i also hit my one of the life one of the main uh l- achievement or goal that i have set up few years back that was like having a contribution merged into bitcoin core and uh i i will spend some time on other uh, bitcoin projects i fell in love with rust uh, i really love the way uh, the rust programming language is designed and uh how it's how easy it is for basically noobs like me to spawn up like very safe and secure system architectures without even knowing much about the details of what happens inside memories and allocators and stuffs so yeah i started coding on rust and as uh, i found out like the rust and bitcoin has a very huge overlap and there are a lot of new infrastructure software infrastructures that are happening in bitcoin space are happening because of rust because of its type safety and memory safety guarantees so uh 6 7 months ago i started working with the rgb team and uh, i was contributing over there and then 2 uh, 3 months ago uh, steve lee from square crypto was generous enough to give me this offer to come and join bitcoin open source full time so yeah that's what i'm in, into right now i'm i'm in the process of making that transition uh from july 1st i'll be joining full time into bitcoin code uh, sorry in bitcoin open source project yeah that is absolutely fascinating and really a, a great journey and i'm curious because it seems that you've always been a curious fellow <laughs> you know studying engineering and then physics uh, even before so even before you got into bitcoin you had this curious mind but right. then yes in after discovering bitcoin you could apply that curious mind much more well freely uh, maybe or it was a much more fulfilling experience for you why do you think is there a difference between these two models and why do you think it is that bitcoin is so well, catching mhm uh very great question um the first thing that caught my breath about bitcoin is uh is the vastness of the discipline itself uh, so there is a very broad categorization that i can make between uh, bitcoin like subjects like at the age of the 
technological frontier, breaking new paradigm, and other subject disciplines like civil engineering, which hasn't been like really evolved in last say 100 years. So we know how beams behave, we know how columns behave, we know how a structure behaves and that behavior doesn't change much. What changes over there on those disciplines is our ability to create more optimum design structure by use of computation and use of other kind of tools that is again provided by computational power. So after that, uh, the, the the reason I fell out of love with my old previous discipline is because there exists an intellectual boundary. So once you are like working in the field or working as a designer um, three, four years down the line or five, ten years down the line, you, you kind of hit this knowledge barrier where there is really, really not much new things you are supposed to learn after that. Uh, so the procedures are mostly standards, the theories are standards, there are nothing groundbreaking happening over there, but unlike uh, the technological frontier, so this is not only just for Bitcoin, but this is common for any kind of technological uh, technological industry or any kind of industry where frontiers are being broken every instant of time. Bitcoin is a very extreme example of such industry. Uh, so here what happens is like as as I can see like the I, I, I cannot see a possible knowledge boundary anywhere near my like long term horizon. I do not see myself like stop learning anytime soon. Uh, so that's the thing that catches my breath. Um, and in, in case of Bitcoin, it goes to extreme because Bitcoin is not just technology. It's just it, it, it's basically culmination of very different kind of disciplines, very different kind of subjects that people previously thought are completely unrelated to each other. But after Bitcoin, we suddenly realized like, oh my God, these all these things are related and they can be combined together in a design that is like a beautiful design uh, that Satoshi made and uh, create some kind of monetary system for the world and that has technological implication economic implication political implication and social implication on our world so yeah it it, it was just fascinating and um, i remember when i started like exploring all these paths parallelly there was a period of time for one or two weeks the uh, the the psychological dissonance was so hard that so many of my worldviews were being shattered uh, simultaneously so fast that it was like kind of like physical pain and it was kind of like a mental stress back then until I figured out like how to habituate with this process and this is actually really happening. This is not just something dreaming. I'm, and um, yeah, and, and this process was basically captivating. And uh, if somebody is curious, if somebody wants to understand how the world works, if somebody wants to understand how different kinds of system works, Bitcoin is basically the best playground that a kid can ever find. So, yeah, that's how, how I feel about it. Yeah, I very much agree with that. Even after quite many years of con contemplating questions in the space, it, there are so many unanswered questions and I just have a gut feeling that there are so many questions that I haven't even come to ask. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, I'm quite sure that it will not get boring, um, even though sometimes I might consider that, yeah, I've somewhat plateaued in some areas. Then if you actually ask nuanced questions, even about those subjects that you think that you have mastered, you will find very quickly that there is a lot of things that you don't yes know. yes so so uh, in, in Bitcoin, the thing i love about bitcoin technical space it like it makes you feel stupid all of the time so <laughs> you you you'll go and talk about bitcoin stuff with irc people and you feel stupid immediately you realize so <laughs> many things that you don't know and as they say in the technical community there there is no expert of bitcoin if somebody says that he's or she is expert of bitcoin that basically means he or she is lying and um, that and and that kind of like a humbling experience you see all these like uh, chimes working in this space and you, you you still find them asking questions you still find them being confused about the system you still find them like being 
intrigued by the all the intricacies of the structure of how this thing is working and uh, yeah all all this thing is just a fascinating and a humbling learning experience for me and i'm enjoying every part of it yeah very much the same for me and i think one contributing aspect to this experience is the free software ethos of bitcoin contributors uh, wh why do you think that plays such a big part into it Mm, nice question and yeah i have been thinking about this for some time and i noticed like well, from the very start when i joined this space i noticed like everything is open source and basically bitcoin is my gateway for software engineering before bitcoin i never really thought about softwares as such i i knew like softwares exist i i my interface to them was like windows icons so if there is an icon for a software i know how to double click it and i know <laughs> that it runs and it's a gui and it does stuff that's all software was to me and with bitcoin i i just just even the fact that there are things called open source stuff this concept was even new for me and it was introduced by bitcoin and then i realized like this is basically part of a very long forming movement that has been happening probably since the since the dawn of softwares since people has been started writing softwares they wanted to share their software like it is the same innate instinct that a child has after making a painting they want to share it with their mom and dad right they want to share it with their friends they want to share it with the siblings because look mommy this is what i made that that's that's the kind of joy of creating and that i think that's where open source stems from open source basically started stemming from this fact that there are software developers who wrote software and they didn't thought of selling it they just said like hey i just wrote a cool bunch of lines like how about you check it out and like see if you can add something over there and that's how like the open source ethos came up and then people like richard stallman and like uh, lena stallwald and all this other projects over, over the late 90s and we went into the digital revolution through the 20, uh, 2000s and now suddenly we are 2020 and all of the important softwares of our world are open source basically and uh, we are in a situation where the closed form industry of technical software uh, technical software industry is basically losing out to the open source industry right because we are seeing like microsoft has to implement a powershell implementation in their windows system because people wanted to make linux like commands in windows right so and uh, with the fact that we are uh, linux and uh, unix like kind of systems are already overtaking our mobile and our server architectures and uh, windows are only relics in the desktop system and i am seeing increasingly like desktops are transforming itself into linux systems and uh, so yeah that's also what is happening in bitcoin and for specifically because of these ideas of bitcoin because it's a open source money because it's a security critical software because it's a system that works in adversarial environment it cannot possibly work in a closed source manner and right now bitcoin is not even a software i i uh, i try to wrap my head around it as a kind of like a living breathing organism that is hosted in the github page where no single person actually knows the full thing no single person actually has the expertise or the command over the full system it's like different people for their different self interest for their different motivation working on different parts of the system and somehow all of this is stable and not just stable it it's creating the most stable monetary unit that we humans have ever seen in our history like how crazy is that so yeah so yeah it's it's an intricate part of and and uh, open source is like this beautiful thing and uh, I, as i explored my journey into this open source and as i am exploring my career into open source i think like this is something kind of like a revolutionary thing kind of like a same way that computers and websites and world world like the internet revolutionized our world in nine in the 90s in early 2000 i think open source carriers and open source softwares is going to change how engineers work in this industry in coming decades yes and i i would hope so right because we see especially with bitcoin what quality of result can be achieved in this free and open source collaboration method 
Uh, and yeah, I think Bitcoin is a testimony to that. Uh, and you mentioned that this is just getting so complex that not one single person could have the ability to understand deeply and truly the entire picture and that everyone is still asking questions. Right? Even the advanced gray beard wizards are still asking questions. But of course, the noobs and the new people entering are also still asking questions. Yet I, I wonder for you, when did come that switch where you could actually answer the question of others in a um, reliable or confident way? Mm -hmm. That happened when basically I started answering my own, own questions to myself because for a long time I had to convince myself that this is actually something something uh, tenable, this is something not breakable and I, I, for the, I, I remember for the first year I basically started exploring all the possible threat model that I can come up with Bitcoin, like how can this system break and uh, as like a, a, a few of the part of those questions we can answer by exploring how the system is designed, but I feel like few of the parts of those questions cannot be answered by exploring the ex simply exploring the design of the system. You have to see the behavior of the system in real society, in real world, because there are second order, third order effects that dictates how this system will behave in different environmental conditions. It, it, it was a fascinating exercise for me and myself to ask this question and answer them in my mind. And that kind of developed my intuition of answering other people's question because most of the time I see like, I, I have already answered that question in my head in some form of some form or other. And I, I love uh, talking about Bitcoin to other people because when I explain the same answer uh, to them, uh, some uh, the, the formulation of the answer changes. Like I can format it much more better and much in much more concise way. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's an ongoing exploration. You never know all the answers of all the questions. And it, 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 it's just a fun experience exploration if you are like that kind of curious kind who wants to understand like this complex pattern of society money software and culture and politics coming and mingling together with each other and it's a it's in general a fascinating question to ask like what happens next so yeah and that's i think is a billion dollar question and nobody none of us actually have a foolproof answer so that's what makes it also interesting in the first place because we don't know what's gonna happen yes absolutely um, and I'm curious because at first you ventured out into the free software contribution space on your own time, you know, after the main work was done, you just spent some of your free time onto building these things. Um, how did that feel initially? And then how was it to make that switch to actually get paid in order to do these contributions? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would say not stressful, but it was generally, uh long hour of work, but it wasn't that difficult because it was never work for me. It was kind of like my play thing. It was kind of like, uh, instead of like playing video games, I used to play in command lines, like let's put it that way. So <laughs> after coming back from work, I used to like talk to Bitcoin, code in bit with Bitcoin CLI, and that was for some weird reason fun to me. And so it didn't really felt like work at that time. So, uh, and, and I have spent like almost like three, three and a half years doing it like this way. And uh, yeah, I started like uh, putting in much more conscious, a conscious effort about like making it some kind of productive work for last one year, I suppose. And uh, going in full time is like kind of like a very, very fulfilling experience, I would say. Like I was thinking about Bitcoin, I was in the Twitter, I was like shit posting and talking about talking to people about Bitcoin, like almost 24 seven uh, previously anyway. So uh, my day job was passed, was the part of the day where I just didn't think about Bitcoin. So I, 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 I got to eliminate that part of from my life. And now I just spend my entire time doing stuffs on Bitcoin and it's a fulfilling experience. I'm getting a ton of things to learn. I am, I am learning a lot about software engineering itself. 
I am learning a lot from other people. The good thing about open source is like people write code and they just post it over there for you to look and check. So you get to see like how other people are writing code. You get to learn from them. And it's an amazing experience in that sense. And yeah, I don't think I can ever go back to having any kind of like corporate job after this experience. Like this has spoiled me in some really bad ways. And yeah, I, I it, it kind of like became my the, the next 10, 20 years uh, career dream to be an open source developer or or be involved in open source project in some ways or others because I find this experience of people freely choosing to contribute their time for a mission, for a reason and for a passion is really, really fulfilling. And this is something that cannot be recreated in a corporate setup. Yeah, I very much agree. Uh, there is just... <laughs> In, in this corporate setup, it's somewhat missing soul in a sense, right? People don't really have skin in the game. And it seems in the free software game uh, that people have soul in the game, right? They're really in it because they love this software or this project and they use it themselves and they know how much it helps and is meaningful and useful to other people. So yeah, this internal motivation on why the work is being done is so important right? and yeah. once and once that is there as you say it no longer feels like work it is more like a mission right uh, or some visionary uh, journey or adventure uh, that is being gone on to but it doesn't really seem like labor that you get yes. tired of yes yes and and uh, i basically picked up this concept as a part of like um part of like a Naval Ravikant's uh, tweet thread where he talked about this concept of work and play. Um, so the idea is like um, the most amount of productivity that a person can possibly achieve when he is engaging in some kind of activity that is play for them. For some people that can be video games, but for some people that can be writing code, running a business, managing community, writing articles or something like that. So yeah, it kind of like um, hits into that core area of like human reasons and why people do what they do. Uh, I don't know, for somewhere I heard in internet like uh, uh, writing code for money is a, a very bad job because writing code is hard and earning money in this world is not that hard actually. Uh, if you know how the world works and if you have certain kind of necks and you know certain basic rules, you can earn a lot of money. But writing code is hard. So a lot of people have this pretense that software engineering is this high paying job, is this high paying career that you go and like have a lavish life. I have seen a lot of my peers doing that, but I have in general observed like they end up become miserable because they don't actually have a reason to do that hard work. They're just doing it for the money. And at some point, no amount of money is actually worth enough to put your brain through that hardship to churn out a beautiful logic that does certain abstract mathematical stuffs inside some system. So yeah, I heard, I, I saw in internet somewhere like uh, people don't uh, write, uh, something like people don't write code for money they write code for a reason uh, or, or something like a quote, quote like that and it made sense to me and uh, i never actually thought about like uh, doing software engineering as a career i i had that option when i began but i never actually liked the like the proposition of like sitting in front in a kiosk in an office and like writing stuffs in a screen and that will be it but in uh, Ironically, I ended up doing exactly that in my civil engineering job also, but because as I found out, like everything is turned into computers and softwares right now. So, uh, so, so yeah. And then I, when I was like making this decision of like whether to join the, or whether to become a software developer full time or not, because I don't have a degree. I don't have a paperwork for this, right? I don't have any official credential that I can show to people if like I, I need to have emergency money or something like that. So, but then at the end, I decided like uh, the reason I want to do this full time because of the specific reason that it doesn't feel like a job. It feels like play to me. It feels like a fun thing. And I really enjoy it. And that's what made it worthwhile doing it in the first place. 
Yes, and it's for sure fascinating that free software can foster this type of, um, well, enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. But I, I wonder, now, now that you have this uh, financial grant from Square Crypto and actually getting paid to do these things that previously you did just out of you know, pure enthusiasm, how did that change your motivation? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it didn't affect my motivation. It actually kind of like affected my urgency with which I used to do the work before. Because uh, back then I had this eight hours. I, I still have, basically, I'm still serving my notice period. Uh, I, I had this eight hours of chunk time that I had to invest in non-Bitcoin stuff. And then after whatever the remaining time you have left in your day without ruining your work-life balance completely, that is like another two, three hours at max, uh, you kind of had to do a lot within that two, three hours. So I, I always had this urgency of like, I had to do this thing by tonight. I had to complete this node setup by this weekend. And uh, right now that urgency kind of goes away. And I can take a step back and uh, look at the whole process of what is happening around me and where I want to position myself and how I want to attack and what kind of problems I want to solve in a much more conscious and much more relaxed way. And I can plan forward. Uh, I'm not, I don't think it will affect my motivation much because my motivation is still remains the same to understand this system and to contribute into it and build like uh, build softwares for financial weapons basically and uh, yeah and that is like a good enough motivation that i can i i have for like the uh, rest of my life that i can keep keep on doing this thing and uh, yeah but, so with the financial support I can do this in a much more relaxed way and I can I, I, I do not need to rush with my timings and I do not need to rush with my work. So that's a good thing. Yeah. So in, in some words, if you previously had a job, right, and you get paid for doing that regular boring job, so to say, then working on Bitcoin in that time, the opportunity to that is just, you know, earning your salary. So if you work a lot on Bitcoin, you cannot have that salary because you won't work for your job. Right. So that's, right. of course, a conundrum. And yeah. then on the contrary, you actually do get paid, even if you contribute to Bitcoin projects, as crazy as, as that sounds. Right? Um, then this removes these opportunity costs and you actually do have some financial income and therefore you know, certainty uh, for the future. Uh, and this is, I think, very good because as, as you laid out, it tends to reduce your time preference. Um, in a sense that you can focus on some longer term projects right, and actually take a holistic look at the underlying problem and see how to find an, a well, fundamental solution to it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's the correct word to use, the time preference. Yes, the time preference of the act, act of working on Bitcoin itself kind of shifts and you kind of go towards this low time preference position where you don't have to like look for some immediate opportunities or look for some immediate projects you want to contribute into and take your time and understand the problems around you and get a much more bigger and efficient bite at it. Yes, very much. Uh, cool. Well, that's that's really nice that this uh, then this financial well, support uh, actually helps you to make more meaningful, long-lasting contributions. Yeah, yeah, I hope so too, yeah. And how is this grant structured? Uh, do you have a specific to-do uh, that needs to be fulfilled in order for uh, that grant to come in? Or is it a more loosely do whatever you want type of deal? It kind of like moves more loosely do whatever you want kind of deal. So uh, Square has been like uh, very generous about and very open about the project that I, I want to select in. And after some discussions and after some back and forth, I basically end up choosing like two open source projects to contribute into and uh, rest of the time I will try to put my time into the review process of Bitcoin code. And uh, uh, yeah, Square was mostly happy and uh, they, they, they didn't add much 
demand in such and because uh, i think that's also because of the reason why the square crypto program the way the program itself is structured so square crypto has two main project of focus that is ldk and bdk and both of these projects are open source and they try to fund people in order to work in these projects but many people work on other projects and they get funding from other sources also and square also uh, funds like uh, core developers who are not working in these projects they also fund some other open source projects not related to bdk and ldk in this way so they also kind of have a very holistic and open view about how the bitcoin ecosystem is working and developing and that i think also allows them to give this opportunity for developers to be as open as possible and be as free as possible and still add meaningful value in some kind of structured or organized way so yeah i think that's really beautiful and uh, yeah i'm quite fortunate to have a grant offer like this and uh, I know a lot of people are like working really hard and who are trying to shift their career into Bitcoin. And I wish like all of them can find out that this open source ecosystem around Bitcoin, not just only Square Crypto, but other organizations coming up with their grant is becoming a vibrant new kind of career opportunity. And that can like really becoming become a, a self-governing and self-organizing industry on its own. Yes, very much so. And I think that financiers like Square Crypto play a really vital role into this. And I think they're doing a, a quite good job uh, at this too. Um, so like, maybe can you go a bit more into the details of that project itself? Uh, is it, I mean, of course, Square is a very large, well, group of multiple companies. Yeah, I think that the only crypto part that uh, Square is related to is Square Crypto, and uh, uh, the the two main project that uh, Square Crypto uh, looks after the organize looks after the development is LDK Lightning Development Kit, led by Matt Corello, and LBDK Bitcoin Development Kit, led by Alex Fellini, Alecos Fellini. And uh, so these are basically like software development kits. So these are tools or libraries that software developers will use in order to create their own wallet implementation. So the idea was like uh, a Bitcoin wallet needs mostly three basic structures. One, it needs a database. Uh, two, it needs a, a blockchain interface where it can communicate with the blockchain or it can fetch information about the blockchain, post data into the blockchain, this kind of stuff. And uh, some way of managing the script pub keys, the private keys, the scrapes, the addresses and all these things. So the idea of BDK is basically... Um, all these three components will be abstracted away in a package library that wallet developers will just input in their code like from some external dependency and like use it straight away the wallet will be spawned with x type of database y type of blockchain and it's a descriptor wallet so you, you uh, it uses descriptors to uh, to describe the script pub keys and the address management so a wallet developer basically needs to then worry about what he cares about is like the wallet logic, how the wallet should look like, how the wallet should behave. And all this Bitcoin specific blockchain specific logic is basically abstracted away. The same thing with LDK, but that's called the lightning part of the story. So uh, uh, there is also a ongoing effort on merging BDK and LDK together. So it becomes a combined library. So wallet developers will just use it. And from the package, they will get lightning access. They will get mainchain Bitcoin access, and they can easily spawn the backend and do the front end on their own, however they want to, however they want to do it. So yeah, it's a, so it, 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 it's, it, it's aimed at like giving more flexibility and more power in hands of wallet developers. So we can see some really great next gen open source Bitcoin wallets out there. Yeah, that for sure is an awesome mission, mission because it is just very tricky to do these underlying things right and proper, right? Just alone, for example, fetching consensus of the Bitcoin network and finding out how many coins a certain address has and what transactions it's involved in. You can make right. so many mistakes here, especially when we consider privacy, right? And there are so many 
easy shortcuts that compromise your privacy or security in some regards. And so to have one proper implementation of this done in a secure language like Rust that can be utilized in multiple other uh, languages, and that is a easy drop-in or software library for other developers to then explore on more creative ways on how to actually display Bitcoin to the user and then how to guide a user journey throughout this entire stack of, of technologies. And now designers can focus on that without needing to worry about the underlying magic that's going on with the cryptography and such. Yes, yes. And uh, also, like, uh, uh, many wallets, like, decide to roll up all these functionalities on their own because they kind of had to. So what happens end up is, like, there are certain uh, discrepancies between different implementations, right? And uh, that can lead into not only security bugs, but uh, for some wallets that can be used as a fingerprinting tools also for blockchain, Bitcoin, and Bitcoin blockchain analysis and stuff like that. So, yeah, it makes sense to uh, abstract away all this part of the thing into some kind of libraries and then the wallet developers can easily spawn up with their Bitcoin wallet without worrying about security and without worrying about best practices and standards like that. And not only that, because we have now PSVT and descriptors, using PSVTs and descriptors, we can really create some very powerful like uh, multi-sig and other kind of like logical Bitcoin wallet structures very easily and they can be interoperable be be between different implementations. So that's also something that BDK makes it possible because it's a descriptor based wallet and it uses PSBT to do all these communications. The interoperability surface using this library becomes very huge and large. So yeah, that's also a very interesting possibility that I'm very excited to see like what people build with this incoming future. Yes, that's very exciting. Uh, so what about, for example, the uh, internet connectivity? So are things like Tor uh, implemented in the BDK? Uh, I'm not sure it's implemented right now, but it's in the roadmap. So it will be implemented or it has been start already started a scratch of it. I'm not sure I haven't looked into that part of the code, but it is in the roadmap to have Tor uh, accessibility through BDK. Because that will be like crucial because the wallet devs doesn't need to worry about Tor connection. I think Tor connection has to be like default way the Bitcoin wallet should communicate and like do anything on the internet. Yes, that's very true. Especially when you stay within the Bitcoin network, uh, Tor works actually quite well. So why not use it? Okay, yeah. but and and then so how does the or how is the blockchain scanned in the BDK? Uh, because I mean, there there are multiple possible ways that could be done. Uh, yes. Which of those are implemented? Yes. So this is where the beautiful nature of Rust as a language comes in, because Rust has something called traits. Uh, we can do a magic that makes it possible that is like we can have like any kind of implementation of the blockchain backend and have it compatible with the BDK library. So BDK library right now has three different implementation of blockchain backend. That is, it can talk to an Electrum server, it can talk to an Explorer server, or it can talk to a code node and act like a compact filter, like a neutrino client and asking and uh, for those B157 and 158 block filters. So these are the out of the box capabilities that wallet devs can directly use. But if, if wallet devs want to have their own back, uh, backend blockchain setup, it's about like, then all they need to do is like implement a certain standard functionalities that is the blockchain trait defined in the BDK library. And they have their own implementation can be interoper interoperable with the BDK wallet itself. So they can replace the client, say the compact filter part of the BDK wallet with their own implementation of the Bit, uh, blockchain, say, suppose by talking to the Bitcoin core via the Bitcoin core RPC, right? So all these kind of flexibilities are already cooked into the library. So the library itself comes with uh, some default implementation of this database. So this is, as you can do this for blockchain, you can also do this for the database. So you can swap the existing database for your own custom implementation of database and have it uh, compatible with BDK wallet itself. So 
uh, yeah, so these are the three blockchains that uh, VDK supports right now. Uh, I will probably be focusing more on the compact filter side of the library because I, I have been always interested in learning about B157 and 158. Um, I will also like uh, uh, post a tutorial very shortly. I have submitted the PR, it's in review. Uh, it's I have demonstrated a very simple way of how to use BDK in order to create a neutrino like wallet that can talk to a Bitcoin core. So if you have a code full node running somewhere, you, you, you can implement a wallet that will just point to the core node and work as a neutrino client. So yeah, a lot of flexibilities and functionalities I think will be available for the wallet devs to use. Yeah, that is really fantastic. And here the flexibility and the modularization of Rust is awesome. Right? That you can just drop and replace some certain certain things, like for example, exclusively the blockchain synchronization, uh, and to move to different implementations that have different trade-offs. Right? Some yeah. might be more secure, some might be more private, some might take more computational time, uh, whatever. But ultimately, the choice is up to the user of this uh, BDK. Uh, and uh, it will allow for a plethora of different user-facing options to emerge, uh, which I think is really cool. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, let's maybe dive down a bit further into the output script descriptors and the PSPT uh, things. You you mentioned that this enables many more advanced setup types. Uh, please elaborate. What cool things can we build? So uh, the BDK uh, website has a blog post called, called Descriptors in the Wild. So uh, the one easy cool thing that we can do is like we can have interoperable, interoperable uh, multi-sig setup. Suppose you have a BDK wallet and you have a core wallet. Now uh, the problem with multi-sig setup is like in order to create the signature of the multi-sig pub key, everybody has to, the two parties involved in the multi-sig uh, multi scheme or the end parties involved in the multi-sig scheme has to derive the same exact addresses at the same uh, step of their transaction process. So for the first transaction, they all have to come up with the same exact script pub key with all same public keys in the exact same sequence. So uh, the question before was to do like, uh, it can be done. So uh, Electrum, Electrum wallet implementation does it in one way, but the problem is some other wallet might do it in other way. And these specifications will not be interoperable with each other. So what happens with the descriptor is like the descriptor is a semantic way of describing a script pub key, right? So by explaining the script pub key in this descriptor language, we can define what the script pub key will look like for this multi-sig setup and then pass around this descriptor to all the end participants and they will use this descriptor and they will check that their public key is part of that descriptors and other public keys are there that they don't uh, they are not concerned about and whenever everybody derives the addresses by the index from that descriptor they always derive the same address they always derive the same script pub key so that solves that interoperability of, it, it's a problem of standardness of how to do a certain task that everybody agrees on the process of doing that task. The task may not be hard, but the process of agreeing to do that task ends up like being hard because not everybody can agree about what to do. So with descriptors they can always agree like this will be the description of our multi-sig setup and everybody agrees they pass around they derive addresses from them and it works so that's how descriptor solves like multi-signatures between different wallets which might not be aware about each other implementations but they can still be interoperable so and uh, PSDT does these things for hardware wallets right because every hardware wallets have different interfaces of talking of taking information about a transaction and so a hardware wallet needs multiple information in order to sign a transaction so all this information has to be submitted to the hardware wallet by softwares and different softwares might do this in different way 
So what ends up happening is like not all softwares are not compatible with all hardware. So just like the descriptors describe semantically the script pub key, the PSBT describes semantically the transaction and its associated metadata that a signing device needs in order to sign that transaction. So once the metadata and the transaction can be passed around in a standard format, so every hardware that supports PSBT becomes automatically compatible with every software that also supports PSBT. So this is also another interoperability and the standardness things that I think that is very crucial for the next generation of infrastructures to come. And yeah, and uh, these are the main two things I think that will be powering uh, interoperability in Bitcoin wallet industry for next few years. Yes, absolutely. And I can second that specifically with HWI and PSBT, which has made the hardware wallet integration to Wasabi so much easier than it otherwise would have been uh, because someone just did all the dirty work of getting all the drivers and firmware compatibility issues fixed in one repository so that other wallets can use it. So yeah, it's, it seems that the BDK is just yet another application of the same type of mindset, right? So let's make yes. as many things work under the hood uh, as possible so that other people can focus on putting the finishing touches on top. Right. Yes, that's, that's exactly the, seems like the vision of this project. And that's why I uh, decided to work on it. I, uh, I, I knew about BDK from the very start. When the BDK project itself started, I, I, I joined in their very initial Slack group, but then I got diverted into other open source projects. So when Steve gave me this opportunity, one of my options was naturally BDK because Alicos and uh, Steve Meyer has done a really fabulous job in like building this library and building documentation and explanation around this space. And it's just a really vibrant community of developers coming from different ways and uh, working on different parts of the project and it's a it's a fun project to work in mm -hmm. so what about future advancements like for example uh, the mini script library uh, bdk already uses mini script because bdk descriptor can be also mini script scripts so bdk uses the mini script library in order to simulate its descriptor functionality so bdk has mini script as a dependency that's awesome. So this is basically already a future future proof for things that are not even yeah. you know fully rolled out yet. Yeah. So uh, till now the Rust Bitcoin ecosystem is still small, and all the cutting edge things are happening in the Rust Bitcoin ecosystem. I think are already being included in all the Rust based Bitcoin projects. So yeah, it, it's kind of like a cutting edge thing working simultaneously in different projects and bringing the frontier together. And speaking of future tech, um, what do you think about Taproot in general and how its activation is going? And when do you think it will be in the BDK? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure it will be in the BDK, but I, I think it will be first implemented in Rust Bitcoin and BDK will has also dependency on Rust Bitcoin. So BDK will simply use it from Rust Bitcoin. But I think it's better to implement that in Rust Bitcoin itself instead of trying to do that in BDK. Uh, uh, Taproot activation right now is going like amazing. You can see like the green streaks of line and uh, it's amazing. It's amazing to see all this support coming in. And, uh, and, and honestly, like this Taproot activation is actually showing us like how to, how to be public about activation process. And it's the kind of celebration that we are having in Twitter, the kind of like uh, anger that people are throwing at miners when they are not signaling. And this is also very public and social, and that's how it was supposed to be, right? It, it, uh, in the software upgrades in Bitcoin is not just a software upgrade. It's also a so social upgrade that happens at, across all, and people should feel that if something is happening and something is affecting the way the software works and they should care about it. And the, the public way of doing this activation, basically, especially with this uh, website where we can track how many miners are signaling and all this is very cool. And we didn't have this back in the SegWit days, right? So yeah, I think uh, it, it's really great that we are having Taproot finally. It's, it's been cooking for almost what, three years now. Uh, 
and after a lot of review and a lot of uh, polishing, the code is finally ready. And uh, uh, I am actually not sure what I am expecting with Taproot because it seems to me like the limit is basically restricted by the imagination of the wallet developers, like what kind of cool scripts that they can think about hiding into the script structure that will facilitate different weird kind of complex kind of policies basically and uh, that will be something interesting to watch so taproot itself might be like uh, obviously snort signature is a big thing right uh, we we have been waiting for snort, snort for so long and finally we are getting snort with taproot but the true potential of taproot i think will take some time to expose itself because people have to come up with crazy ideas, I think, in order to see where the full limit of Taproot lies. Because if you are doing simple one-to-one -one transaction or simple multi-sig setups or lightning channels, Taproot is not much interesting in that kind of applications. But it becomes really interesting when you start like exploring crazy things. Yes, and I'm already excited about all the quote-unquote boring and already known use cases that we can do with Schnorr and Taproot. But yes, I'm yes, very excited. Yes, yes. Uh, there, there is a repository of like uh, boring applications, but magical applications have waiting for Schnorr's that we can just do on Bitcoin that isn't just simply possible and without Schnorr. And so that's something that I am also like hugely excited about and i think like the moment we see snore i think a lot of those implementations and ideas are already full fledged that the moment we have like this kind of commitment scheme and homomorphism in the signature structure uh, we can do a lot of magics instantaneously yeah very true and that will keep us busy for a couple of years just alone to get the boring features implemented <laughs> yeah then if we want to really get going with the interesting stuff, that's a couple more years. Uh, so again, as we spoke about earlier, it's for sure not going to get boring. Never, never. There is a, not a single boring day in Bitcoin. Yeah, never. <laughs> yes. So let's let's talk a bit about the, the Lightning Development Kit, or I'm not sure how, how much you're actually involved in that. Uh, I'm not much involved in that part because uh, Lightning is also a very complex thing on itself and uh, I haven't been gathered enough confidence to be, uh, start making meaningful contribution into the Lightning uh, light LDK project. But uh, as, I, as I hear, it's going pretty well and uh, people are uh, looking about integrations between BDK and LDK into some kind of like um, merged package and then uh, open up bindings from that package in two different languages that other people can use. So as far as I can understand from the overview, so Lightning LDK is basically the same concept that BDK uses, like figure out what the infrastructure or wallet developer needs and then segregate them out and make them inter make them exchangeable, make them replaceable so that people can flexibly put in their, their own implementation instead of the default implementation. So I think like LDK is also developed in that way, but in that case, you have like this peer management thing, this channel management thing, then channel backup thing, and all those things are like modulated into separate compartments that wallet devs can use from the default or they can implement their own ways. But I'm not very familiar with the details of the library, so I don't want to comment something outlandish about it without knowing the details too much. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but that sounds, again, very interesting, right? I, I just really like this modular infrastructure where you can drag and drop uh, and replace certain things. Uh, but I'm so I'm wondering: Is the the Lightning Development Kit is this considered a new full node implementation? No, no, it's not. Uh, the documentation suggests that it's possible to spawn your own full node in or uh, with this implementation. So you have to kind of like create the daemon on your own. But the component, but the ingredients to create the full node is already there. So it's not just something that you can install and run, but if you know how to create a daemon structures or something like a background process, that w then it, it, it's trivial to e make a full node using it because all the ingredients that you need to cook up a full node is already there. 
Uh huh. So the even though the Lightning Development Kit has all features that a Lightning node would require to have, basically, uh, it follows all sp bold specifications. Specifically, um, in order to use it, you cannot just run the B uh, the Lightning Development Kit, right? But yeah. you need to build an application that uses the Lightning Development Kit, and then this new application that you have built basically has the Lightning Node cap capabilities. Yes, right. That's correct. I see. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. But what I a bit wonder um, is with with now the LDK, it seems that we will have even more quote unquote different Lightning Node implementations. But then there mm -hmm. might always be some break in the consensus among them. Now there's a difference between on-chain consensus breaks and Lightning consensus breaks. Yet still, both of them are not optimal. So how do you see yeah. that playing out? Yeah, that's that's in general, I think, a problem with multiple implementations. And I don't think that problem can really be solved. It, it, it still exists in Bitcoin too, right? But there is a reason why we have a major reference implementation of Bitcoin because of the specific difficulty of uh, being in consensus among multiple implementations. And as you have said, like on-chain consensus breaking is much more catastrophic than off-chain consensus breaking. But yeah, there is always a possibility of doing uh, of that happening, but uh, that's why we have the bold specification. But there are a few contentious points among the bold specification too, I suppose. And uh, if the many implementation does a lot of details in their own ways that are not actually described in specification because those people writing specification thought that will be like too much uh, specific about uh, specification. So they left it in towards the implementers and uh, yeah, uh, that can always happen, but I don't see like how you can possibly solve that without like converging into a single major implementation and then use this for every other cases. But that might not be possible for different kinds of needs that people might have with different lightning infrastructures. So there will always be a possibility, but I believe that and I hope that the standards will keep on improving over and over uh, uh, as more people start uh, stumbling upon this kind of consensus bugs. And uh, yeah, it, at the overall, I think the standard itself is going to get more robust, more better and more uh, complete. So in that sense, it will be kind of probably like a trial and error kind of process and ultimately we will reach someplace stable. Yeah, that sounds, I think, quite reasonable and again, a bit chaotic, but well, that's half of the beauty of the free software collaboration method. Yeah, yeah, true. So, but let's walk through one uh, specific example where let's say I want to build a wallet with the BDK kit uh, and I want to include something that is currently not yet implemented in this BDK. Uh, let's say, for example, Wabi Sabi coin joint features. Uh, mm -hmm. quote, hint, hint, maybe that's a feature I actually do want to have in the BDK. <laughs> so how would I go about of getting a new feature into the BDK and then using it in my application. Mm, yeah, so in that case, I think what would be the way to go is like not trying to implement that into BDK itself, but use BDK and your extra logic of whatever new logic that you want to incorporate and create our new structures out of it. So uh, the structure doesn't need to have all those capabilities of the backend part because that's also already uh, abstracted away by BDK, the structure will handle this extra logic and then it will talk with BDK with the for, for the backend and the basic blockchain functionality. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, it will not be something very difficult. You will not do it directly in the BDK itself. You will probably create your own application where you will just use BDK and then you will have the rest of the Wabi Sabi code and merge these two together where you will have this Wabi Sabi logic running in an application which has a wallet that has the backend and database managed by BDK and your application basically managed probably the front end and the Wabi Sabi logic. Uh -huh. So that's very interesting. Then you, so you might have a different library or development kick kit that implements this crypto and coin join logic and then you 
this part of the software make sure that the coin join is secure and then whenever it is it basically tells the bdk hey sign this transaction and the bdk yeah. does so yeah yeah so basically we can think about it like a software kit on top of a software kit on top of a software kit like that so we can keep on building the software key stack like that with different functionalities like depending upon different uh, requirements so we can easily have like a coin join wallet implementation as a library that wallet developers can use so all the coin join stuff the blockchain stuff the database stuff the wallet stuff all of those parts are abstracted away by the library itself and i think like all these things can be like uh, built in separate projects maintained by separate people it doesn't have to be one single big monolithic huge repo uh, it can be like multiple projects spread across the user user spectrum and uh, people can use whatever kind of flavors of implementation that they need and they want okay and so to stay inside the rust ecosystem I would basically create a new crate <laughs> that does the Wabi Sabi yeah. magic. Yes, yes. You basically create a new crate that you have the Wabi Sabi logic written in Rust. Then you simply use the BDK as a dependency and you import the BDK library. And whenever you want to use a wallet uh, with, to do the wallet stuff, you just call BDK and say, hey, do my stuff for this. And BDK will happily do that and return you the result. You take the result, put it into the Wabi Sabi code, turn it to more processing. and or do whatever the output you want to get out of it. Yes, and right. then just to highlight here, that's the beautiful thing of such a modular infrastructure is that you can use the BDK and change it and add new things that you would like to have in your final product. And you don't even have to ask for permission from those upstream developers or for them to change anything, right? This, yep. this can all be done modular by yourself. Yes, it's, it's permissionless beauty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, very much. Well, I'm I'm very curious how this all further develops, and I think we have a lot of potential to, you know, bring together coin joins and Lightning Network and uh, many other privacy-preserving technologies in the future uh, in this BDK. It sounds really fantastic. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's why I'm, I'm I'm really bullish on this kind of projects, and this kind of projects is exactly what we need in order to build our software infrastructure. And uh, Bitcoin is going to be the next generation generational financial systems, and financial systems and any kind of systems doesn't work without infrastructures. And for the for first decade, what we had is basically the trial of the idea itself. We realized that the idea works. Now the question is how to get this idea into industry scale and into enterprise level and into homes of people. And uh, building up interoperable modular software infrastructure is the way to go. Yes, very much. And so, as you say, the, the scope of the BDK really is very broad, right? From small phone applications all the way to small server units, as well as to full grade enterprise uh, grid levels. Right. Yes. So, but uh, but the BDK project doesn't include all those scope in in itself. The BDK project just aims to be flexible and modular enough so all these use cases can be handled by the user of the library of their own. Yeah, that's really nice indeed. Awesome, Rush. I think we we covered quite a lot uh, today uh, in terms of the BDK and your contributions and motivations to work on free software projects. Are there any other things that you have pressingly on your mind that you would like to bring up? No, uh, I think uh, we had talked. Uh, all, all, we have covered almost a lot of things, and uh, yeah, it has been a fun conversation. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't have anything specific in mind right now, uh, but there is always like if you keep talking about Bitcoin, it it can go on forever and ever. So yeah, I think that would be enough for. Uh, good bite chunk of conversation on Bitcoin. Yep. Awesome. Well, Rash, then I thank you very much uh, for joining me here at the Wasabi Cast podcast uh, to talk a bit about Bitcoin and privacy and the motivations uh, that you have to work on what you work. Uh, so tell us, where, where can the people find you? How can they reach out and how can they help to contribute? Um, I'm in Twitter at Rajoshi Mitra. And uh, I am also in a Telegram group, uh, Bitcoin India. It's the link of the Telegram group is also in my Twitter bio. So there we maintain a group of Indian Bitcoiners. We talk and help people about Bitcoin and stuff. 
you can chat over me with there i am my dms are open just send a hi or a hello and i always reply so yeah i i am i am mostly around in the bitcoin twitter space doing shit post and having fun exactly as it should be so peers thank you very much uh, for coming back online to the join the wasabi podcast and we will see each other on the next show bye bye <laughs>